Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to another Bible study with Sister Denise and Straight Thinking Teaching Ministries. We are continuing our study in the Word of God out of the New Covenant book, Matthew. Matthew chapter 17, and we are going to dive in God's word. And we are going to be rich, richly, I mean richly blessed because of the hope that is in the word of God and the reputation of both God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ are on the line. They put themselves on the line for the fulfillment of this awesome, awesome, awesome event that's on his calendar. And he wants you and I to be a part of that magnificent event. Matthew chapter 17 describes what we can look forward to as those who have placed our trust for the here and now and eternity in the Lord Jesus Christ. Before we get started and delve into the Word of God, I want to give you an opportunity, if you are already haven't already done so, good, get your Bibles. Don't rely on Sister Denise. You need to have the Word of God so you can be blessed yourself, that your eyes can be blessed, that your mind can be blessed as your eyes read, and then it filters down into your soul. But get your Bible and know of a certainty for yourself that what I'm reading you is actually there, that the context that I'm using and, and um, teaching from and emphasizing is the exact same context. You need to know that and that the Holy Spirit will minister the truth of God's word to you and give you that blessed assurance that you are hearing his voice. Now, I'm not God. God knows, Lord, I'm, that's not it at all. And neither is anybody else for that matter who is teaching God's word. But it's his spirit that is coming out of me to share with you the wonderful things in the wonderful word of God concerning his plan for you, for his universe, and for eternity. So those of you who already have your Bibles, praise God. I hope that you are prepared uh, with your questions. Get also your notepad and get your pen or pencil and you, Write your thoughts down, the questions that come into your mind uh, as you read and study God's word and, and, and ask God's people. And if one doesn't know, then go to the next, go to the next, but be ready when someone is presenting spiritual truths to you or things that they are presenting as spiritual truths, you need to have a mechanism to filter what is true and what is deception. And only God's word is able to do that. So having grabbed your Bibles, and before we get started, I want you to find us on YouTube, Straight Thinking Teaching Ministries, uh, S-T-T-M are capitalized, but it's all together one word. 
I want you to subscribe. I want you to like us and um, always go back to study what's already been presented and ask the Holy Spirit to open up your mind, open up your heart to uh, the see whether the things that this woman is saying is true concerning you, okay? And if they're not, you know, he'll get me, that's for sure. Uh, I'll be judged with many stripes as the word of God has already declared. And so that being said, and after six days, Jesus taketh Peter, he takes James and John, his brother, the two brothers, James and John and Peter. Uh, and he takes them into a high mountain apart from everyone else. Now, this is Jesus' uh, second time doing that with these three same persons. So he had disciples. And then within that uh, first private group, were 12 and that's the one we're more familiar that group we're more familiar with and then from within that group of 12 jesus had three whom he uh, brought into his innermost circle to convey and to demonstrate and to show things that they would then share after his decease with the other disciples. And so those three persons are Peter and the two brothers, James and John. And he was transfigured before them and his face did shine as the sun and his raiment was white as the light. And behold, there appeared unto them Moses and Elias or Elijah and they were talking with him. Pause. Because we know that Jesus was born sometime between six and four BC, right? Now it, using our dating calendar, the time that we are reading about right now, it's roughly 26 AD. That being established and clearly established, with did Moses and Elijah? come from where? Because see, we know that Moses roughly was born around 1526 BC or BCE. And we know roughly he died around 1406 BCE. We also know that Elijah was a prophet during the period of the prophets who prophesied during the regnal rules of both the Northern and the Southern kingdoms. Specifically, we know that Ahab was on the throne at that time. And according to my notes here, Ahab ruled roughly between 874 and 853 BCE. Now, you don't have to be a rocket scientist to figure out the math first with Moses and then second with Elijah. And then of all the men of God that he used and women of God that he used in the BC period that we know of. And of course, during his ministry, 
which we do have some names. Why only Moses? Why Elijah? And where have they been? Because you're talking. 13, 14, 1500 years in one case, or close to that. And then another 900 in the case of Ahab plus or close to it. So we'll come back and entertain these questions and the implication of what he revealed to these three apostles. Now, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go into the book of Luke and read this because Luke gives us more detail about what's going on with this particular event in the life of Jesus that is profoundly significant because of the implications. And if you are not saved today, if you are not born again of the word of God and the spirit of God today, if you don't know Jesus in the pardon of your sin and you have a belief system other than that of the scriptures, I'm glad you tuned in because your eternal destination hinges on this event. what it foreshadows for both Jesus and us and all the saints up to that time who put their faith in God. This is absolutely awesome. And I want you to participate in that with me. And I want to participate in this with you. Let's go to Luke. And we're going to pick this up in chapter 9 for those details because they do make a difference and give details Matthew don't give us because that's not his goal as he is reporting out to us <clears throat> concerning the life of Jesus Christ. Then he called his 12 disciples together and he gave them power over all the demons and to cure diseases. That's not where I want to go. All right, I think it's... Down here. There we go. Uh, Luke chapter 9 and verse 28. <clears throat> he was ministering. They were ministering in a different place, a certain place. And they fed another 4,000 plus people beside, you know, the men. And it came to pass after eight days, after these sayings, he took Peter, John, and James and went up into a mountain to pray. So again, he's asking his closest disciples and friends, come pray with me. And there was a designated place. 
And as he prayed, the fashion of his countenance was altered and the raiment was white and glistering. And behold, there talked with him two men who were Moses and Elias, who appeared in glory and spake of his decease, which he should accomplish at Jerusalem. But Peter and they that were with him, James and John, they were heavy with sleep. And when they were awake, they saw his glory and the two men that stood with him. So let's unpack this. No doubt this is late in the evening, if not night. Jesus is a man of prayer, constant prayer, praying all night long. But his disciples, not so much. And on more than one occasion, left him praying while they slept. And here is another example of that happening. Another situation where he needed them to be in a certain place with him and they weren't prepared, ready, or their bodies just gave out. So they doze off to sleep, but something awakened them out of their sleep. And when that happened, the three of them are eyewitnesses to the transformation. of light and to see Moses and Elijah conversing with him and what they were talking about. They were talking about his, that is Jesus's, decease as he heads towards to Jerusalem to allow himself to be offered as the perfect offering and Lamb of God to do what? Taketh away the sins of the world as his name declares. Now, all you we could do is speculate on what Moses and Elijah were thinking, especially Moses. Because they were talking with him about his decease. Moses delivered the people of God on an earthly realm out of Egyptian bondage. Gave the people the law. Oversaw with minute detail the building and erection of the wilderness tabernacle according to the pattern that was shown to him in the mountain, in the wilderness. So it just makes one wonder what discussions Moses was having But then I want to throw this in here too. So now Moses, while in his earthly, earthly body, was not permitted by God to enter into the land of Canaan. 
Yet, when he and Elijah are standing there with the Lord Jesus Christ, in a form that made him different, that made them different. And yet it was in this atmosphere, this world, subject to gravity and the other, other laws of this world to some degree de or defying them. And yet Peter, James, and John slept through until the very end of this discourse. And Peter who was witnessing this and blown away as well as John and James by what they were witnessing. They were awestruck and so was Peter. And yet Peter gained enough of himself to respond. But Peter and they that were with him were heavy with sleep. And when they were awake, they saw his glory and the two men that stood with them. And it came to pass as they departed from him, Peter said unto Jesus, Master, it is good for us to be here. And let us make three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. Not realizing what he had said. While he thus spoke, there came a cloud and overshadowed them, and they feared as they entered into the cloud. And this reads more detail specific than Matthew. Matthew has kind of given us a general overview, but Matt, uh, but Luke being the historian, the doctor, as he is and as he was. While he thus spake, there came a cloud and overshadowed them, that is Christ, Moses, and Elijah, and they feared as they entered into the cloud. And then there came a voice out of the cloud saying, this is my beloved son. This one here, fear him and hear him. Hear him. And when the voice was passed, Jesus was found alone. And they kept it close and told no man in those days any of those things which they had seen. Now let's flip over back to Matthew. And was, well, and after six days, Jesus taketh Peter, James, and John, his brother, and bring them up into a high mount apart and was transfigured before them. And his face did shine as the sun and his raiment was white as light. And behold, there appeared unto him Moses and Elias talking with him. Notice the difference and where Luke is putting the emphasis and where uh, Matthew is not. 
Then answered Peter and said unto Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you will, let us make here three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. While he yet spake, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and behold, a voice out of the cloud which said, This is my beloved son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. And today my charge to you is to hear Christ. And you can hear him and you do hear him. The day that you hear his voice, do not harden your heart as those did in the day of provocation. Please don't do that. The real Jesus, his voice is gone out in the world today and he is still speaking. Hear him. Don't hear Sister Denise. Don't hear my group, your group. And, and let alone the stuff that we're hearing uh, off our devices. Hear him. This is a matter of life and death. And when the disciples heard it, they fell on their face and were sore afraid. And Jesus came and touched them and said, Arise. Don't be afraid. And when they had lifted up their eyes, they saw no man except Jesus only. And I want to divert just a little bit here because some believers and some who are not believers but have been around the congregation of God. And there is a, a subgroup of Christians, a subset of those who are in the way, who identify as Christian. And they are identified by a name, Jesus only. And when they use that term to identify themselves. The classic understanding is that they believe that Jesus is the Father, He is the Son, and He is the Holy Ghost or Holy Spirit. The scriptures, however, do not speak of the Lord God, the Father, or the Holy Spirit in those terms. He is not molding, or he is in a mode at some point, switching roles. The flip side of that is that those of us who follow the scripture and how the Holy Ghost has watched and preserved over it do not view that believing that there is a Father and Son and Holy Spirit, we don't believe in three gods. What that means to us is that Jesus, the Father, and the Holy Spirit are of the same substance, the same stuff. Whatever God is, so is Jesus. And so is the Holy Ghost. Quite candidly, uh, 
God has manifested himself in more than just three ways for that matter, if you want to look at it like that. But this Jesus only idea or belief system has some obvious problems to it for with, who was God in this case? Who was the father talking to? When he said, this is my beloved son, hear ye him. Why would he deceive you? Speaking of someone else. When it was him all along. And the same could be said of Christ Jesus. So the challenges to your understanding of the nature of Jesus is not new. The beginnings of this way of thinking of Jesus in order to maintain the monarchy, if you will, his godship. Let's just let the scriptures speak to us because the, one of the jobs of the Holy Ghost is he will take the things of Christ and he'll show them unto you. He's going to reveal it unto you. But this challenge to his nature of his beginnings is a old what the church viewed or should I say the body of believers in the way viewed as coming from one who was in the assembly, the body, and who developed this line of theological thinking of Jesus in this way as moving from role as the father, role as the son, role as the Holy Spirit, just as a, a, a husband carries titles. If he's a, a husband and if he has children and one of them happened to be a son, he is no, he's not just a husband. He is a father. He has siblings, so he's a brother. And so they use those analogies as a way of understanding how Jesus could mold from one position of the Godhead to the other and still maintain his Godship. But that is not how the scripture develops the challenge and what he's saying of the Father, of the Son, and the operation of the Holy Ghost. His name is Arian. They call it Arianism. Or another form is Sibelianism. And you can find these individuals, 
just Google their names on the internet and discover how they have influenced the congregation, the visible body of Jesus Christ down through the years. I am not suggesting by no stretch of the imagination, although you can hear that and know that, uh, that uh, if you're honest, that these people who embrace this or, or uh, understand and believe Christ in this way are unsaved. That is not what I am suggesting or saying at all. Error, yes, because we all do. But the scripture just does not support that way of thinking concerning the person of Jesus. And neither did the early believers who were in the way. So as we move through the scriptures, I will touch on the theological significance of Jesus to address those difficult questions. How do we reconcile God was in Christ? reconciling the world unto himself. How do we reconcile that in the beginning was the word? The word was with God and the word was God. How do we understand those kinds of scriptures? How do we understand? I am God and I change not. You are my witness saith the Lord that I am he. And beside me, there is no other savior. There was no God before me, neither shall there be after me. How, how do we understand those scriptures? Well, the Holy Ghost, he is our teacher. And he will lead you and guide you into all truth. So I'm going to build the argument. And when I see these uh, portions of scripture where I can touch on the theological in more detail, I will. So if you are from the family and you believe Jesus only. Okay, well, you believe that, but you've got some hurdles that are blatantly obvious to overcome from the scriptures. And I don't think you can do it. Because the scriptures just do not deliver that to us. And behold, a voice out of the cloud which said, this is my beloved son. So what happened? Did Jesus freeze in motion the body so that he can switch and become the spirit, the father, and then speak? And then when he finished, came back into the body, that doesn't make any sense. You've, it, that just does not make any sense. And one thing about it, yes, the word of God, the, the Godhead, great is the mystery of godliness, but it's not like you can't understand it though. The mystery and the mysterion of it is how and why would he do it? How was God manifest in the flesh? Through the Son. Preached through the Son. Seen of angels after the resurrection. 
in pre-incarnate Christ through the Son. Believed on by the Gentiles. Received up in glory. See, that's that's the meat of the of the of the word of God because it has eternal implications. And as we grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, we will have to deal with these questions. And when his disciples heard it, they fell on their face and were sore afraid. When you come into the presence of God, when I come into the presence of God, he's not my buddy. He's not your buddy. And these people claiming to have these ongoing regular conversations with God and, and, and God is telling them and certain things and then Jesus appears and he takes them somewhere and what he likes and don't like, that's nonsense. That is the imaginations in the heart of those who say such things. A careful study, even a cursory study of the scriptures does not convey that kind of relationship with holiness and humanity. And because of this kind of casualness, there's an utter disdain and disrespect for Jesus that is undeserving, but because of our own blasphemies and, and downright ignorance, the world looks on us and mocks and disbelieve this wonderful salvation. And when they lifted up their eyes, they saw no man except Jesus only. Now they had seen Jesus, Moses, and Elijah. But then when they lifted up their eyes, they saw no man except Jesus only. And I am going to switch uh, screens here. And we're going to talk about these three personages. We saw Jesus. We saw Moses, we saw Elijah. What does all this mean? Let's look at the men that were seen and let's look at their names and let's understand somewhat. Jesus, Matthew gives us the meaning of his name. Jehovah is salvation. You shall call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Yahshua, salvation. Moses. Moses, Egyptian by nationality, by citizenry, born in Egypt. From the tribe of Levi, so then by ancestry, 
Hebrew. But genetically, he is Canaanite, Semitic Canaanite. And technically, since we know his genealogy, we can go all the way back to Ur of the Chaldees. Chaldean. So in Egyptian, Moshi or Moses means son or born. In Hebrew, his name means to pull out or draw out. Elijah means Yahweh, Yahweh, the distinction of Yahweh from the pagan names and idols of Elijah's day. Yahweh is my God. Yahweh has become our salvation. He has bought us out of sin and shame and has become our salvation. So the significance of Moses and Elijah extends into eternity. Because as I alluded to and just dropped off was, where did they come from? And where have they been? having been deceased centuries before. And how did Peter, James, and John recognize who they were? And so what? So what for us? Let's go into the word of God. I'm gonna leave that up there to give you an opportunity to write those scriptures down. And these aren't the only ones, but we're gonna to go to 1 John first. What does it mean? What is the significance? First and foremost, The God who created mankind. Your origins are in the man, the first Adam, and his wife Eve, who were created by the awesome hands of God Almighty. Is the God of the living. It's important, my friend, what you think about this Jesus, the Jesus of this scripture. Not what you heard about him, what you think, but what God has testified of him. He said, this is my son, hear him. Hear him. So in the first John chapter three, behold, what manner of love the father, uh oh, there we go again, hath bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore, 
the world knoweth us not because it knew him not. You cannot get your theology of Jesus or anything concerning righteousness from Netflix, from ABC News, from Fox, CNBC. The world does not know God. And it doth, beloved, now are you. Now are we the sons of God, not at a future date. At the moment we believe with all of our heart, now are we the sons of God and it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Did not Moses and Elijah, were they not like him? And did they not see him as he is? And did not Peter, James, and John get a glimpse into what was in store for them? They are eyewitnesses to this. So God is the God of the living. And every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself even as he is pure. Do you have this hope? You say you are a believer? Do you have this hope of being like him? because you will see him as he is? If you do, you are occupied with purifying yourself. And God knows we need it in the United States. You can't turn on the phone, your email, the television, whatever device, And it's all driven. It's either sex, money, power. The three old menaces to mankind. Repackaged for 2022. Let's go into 1 Corinthians. Get ready because death, the separation of the spirit from the physical body, it's not over for you. And my sister, my brother, or my friend, or my enemy who happens upon this, and you thinking about committing suicide, this won't end it. That won't end it for you. There's more to you than just the flesh. Satan, the Lord rebuke you in the name of Jesus. When your spirit separates from this body, which is corruption and corruptible, your spirit is going back to the Lord who gave it. That's one another the reason why he was able to call Moses and Elijah at the time he did. Another teaching moment for Peter, James, and John. So ending your life, it doesn't end there. First Corinthians 
15. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also you have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if you keep in memory what I have preached unto you, unless you have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures. He did not die because he said something Rome did not like. He didn't die for you to attempt to do good in this life. He took your place and mine because of sin. So that you and I would not have to pay the price and the penalty before the Father. And with that, we have eternal life. And that he was buried and that he rose again the third day, according to the scriptures. And that he was seen of Cephas and then of the twelve. And after that, he was seen above. 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain unto this present, but some of them are fallen asleep. After that, he was seen of James and then of all the apostles. And last of all, he was seen of me also as one of them born out of due time. And then I'm going to move down to verse 51. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, that is, die, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump. For the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall all be changed. For this corruptible, what you see with Sister Denise is corruptible. It must put on incorruption. And this mortal, what you see, what others see of you, must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O grave, O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin. And the strength of sin is the law. And while both are here, that is death and the law, you will see and you know that sin has not been conquered yet, that it has not been fulfilled. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. So the significance of the transfiguration changed into something different my Lord, my God, is beyond this world. So don't give up hope. Be steadfast. Be unmovable. And for some of my brothers and sisters, I understand that you are going through 
you are going through hell. Some demonic despot has thrown you in prison. You're hungry. You're not in the most desirable conditions. Nowhere near it. Your work in the Lord is not in vain. Your work at this time, if that's you, hold on to your faith. Continue in your faith. You will be rewarded. It gives us a glimpse into our future. There is hope. There is hope for us. Eyes have not seen, neither ears have heard, neither has it entered into the heart of man the things that God has prepared for them that love him, but he has revealed them unto us, his servants, by his Holy Spirit. He is the God of the living. And you, my friend, my enemy, you can live today. Because right now, apart from Christ, you are dead in your sins and trespasses. And you are an enemy of God. And the judgment of God abides on you every moment of the day. I don't want to see that happen to you. I want you to rejoice with me. I want to be with you. I want to sing with you and, and, and with the brothers and sisters in Christ. And until that day, we are called up to join him and meet him in the air. May God bless you. May God keep you. May God make his grace to shine upon you and keep you in perfect peace all week long. And we'll pick up on that peace where Jesus commanded Peter, James, and John not to share this transfiguration that's the word that they use uh, with the other disciples until after he had risen from the dead. What a wise, what a wise God.